All right. Um, thanks for that introduction. I'd forgotten the line about uh, cheeky flair and think I might put it on my gravestone. I, I, that's a way to be remembered. Um, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for being here. Uh, there, uh, I want to start by uh, mentioning something that may seem random because uh, there exists out there in the cultural zeitgeist a conspiracy theory known as birds aren't real. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Um, its members use social media, especially TikTok and Reddit, and they use slogans like, if it flies, it lies, um, and acts that could uh, best be described as performance art. And they use all of this to spread the message uh, that uh, the US government has wiped out the bird population and replaced them all with lifelike drones that are surveilling the American populace. So the movement's leader is a 23-year-old named Peter McIndoe. And he's managed to pull together a loose network of like-minded, mainly Gen Z co-conspirators uh, into this movement that produces hilarious material like these photos uh, captioned. Um, <laughs> these older models still have visible antennae. Uh, I added the proper plural, I should confess. And um, this needlepoint, which uh, is available through Etsy if you're looking for any uh, summer craft options. Uh, I hope it's obvious that they are in on the joke. Um, this is not a real conspiracy theory. Uh, far from believing in some kind of avian conspiracy, they participate in it as a means to maintain their equilibrium amid the disruption of meaning and the absurdity of misinformation that's so much a part of the contemporary moment. As one of their members puts it, uh, in a uniquely bleak time to come of age, it doesn't hurt to have something to laugh about together. And indeed, it is kind of a bleak time uh, because the truth, the, uh, the skills of assessment of truth claims, the, the competence to apply existing knowledge in new situations, and the ability to engage in discernment across dis disagreement, all of those hallmarks of the humanist project have atrophied in public use. And the study of ancient religion, whether in biblical studies or religious studies departments, is likewise not as influential as it once was. We're losing positions and sometimes departments. Collectively, we've become the equivalent of the humanities 90 pound weakling on a beach that's crowded with STEM programs and uh, business programs flexing their muscles and kicking up sand. So today I want to discuss all of that under this umbrella of meaning loss and to consider fleetingly how maybe we're part of that state of affairs. I expect on the face of it that the diagnostic of meaning might feel too vague to be useful, uh, but here I want to begin by lodging it in some cognitive studies before moving on to consider a test case of the early Christ movement. Uh, the images uh, that I'm using on the title slide so far of the Hindenburg, um, they play with the title of this presentation. The phrase, oh, the humanity, entered our cultural repertoire when it was uttered by the radio broadcaster Herbert Morrison, who was reporting live on the landing of the Hindenburg in New Jersey when it crashed and burned, and he cried out with that phrase. I promise that my comments aren't headed in such an apocalyptic direction, but I couldn't resist uh, starting there. In a review essay published this March in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Johan Neem discusses three monographs, a total of three published within the last year 
on the topic of the state of the university. And two of them offer competing analogies for the kind of turbulence that we're in the middle of. On the one side, um, Arthur Levine and Scott Van Pelt uh, find their analogy for the present moment in the shift to on-demand streaming services in the entertainment industry. In light of that analogy, they contemplate a, a very specific future for higher ed, which, uh, to quote them, uh, will involve the rise of any time, any place, consumer-driven content and source agonist, uh, ag agnostic, sorry, un probably agonistic as well, agnostic, unbundled, personalized education paid for by subscription. It's not an appealing vision for me. The second book uh, by the historian Ronald Musto looks instead to the past for its analogy uh, for the contemporary moment. And uh, Musto considers the dissolution of monasteries under Henry VIII as the instructive analogy. Musto begins with the great, what he sees as the great achievements of monasteries. And he argues that they accomplished this in part because of their independence, their separateness from civic authority, and even to some extent from their local context. And that separation, according to him, contributed to their innovations in healthcare, urban planning, agriculture, the arts, and the preservation of knowledge. By the 16th century, however, this very separation that once helped facilitate innovation was now seen as ossified uh, and self-serving. It was seen now as exclusion instead of just separation. So fueled both by, the personal con by his own personal convenience and the growing public disdain for monasteries, King Henry initiated a takedown. The change was rapid and its results weren't thoroughly orchestrated, even though they were effective. They weren't even uh, anticipated. Musto describes this moment as, and here I quote him, the bursting of a seed pod and the dispersal of its contents or the breakdown of a cell wall and the spread of its protoplasm, the old enclosed separate institution of monasticism now dissolved into the secular lay landscape of Britain. One of the results, of course, of that dissolution was the birth of the university. So this thinly distilled summary hardly does justice to the contributions of these two books. Um, certainly for that, you can look to the review essay by Neem. In it, uh, Neem, saves his harshest criticism for the Levine Van Pelt model of the future. He suggests not only that their prognostication is premature, but more severely, he feels like it holds no real diagnostic insight. Uh, Levine and Van Pelt lack the kind of nuanced analysis of the relationship between academia and society that Musto's historical analysis exemplifies. Musto places his finger on a particular pressure point, and that is this productive tension that he sees uh, repeated in the current circumstances of universities, the productive tension between separateness on the one hand and relevance on the other, and the need for the push and pull, the tension between them. His notion of separation is manifested both in time, that universities provide this period of study devoted to the development of critical capacities, and also a separation of authority, that universities are free, academic freedom um, is freedom from the ideologies of the culture wars and pressures from what he calls activist governing boards and external stakeholders. But to uh, riff for a minute on a concept from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the freedom that this separation purchases has to amount to more than cheap tenure. 
in which academic freedom is just this commodity for the lucky few. That freedom has to be for something. And he argues for the world beyond the university, hence relevance. So in Musto's analysis, the balance between these tensive forces, separation and relevance, is the physics necessary for the survival of universities. What Neem adds to this is to remind us that relevance that just tracts contemporary trends like that of Levine and Van Pelt is too flimsy a construct to generate the necessary gravitational pull to ground us in the future. All right, so Neem leaves us here with a view from 1,000 feet, but others help us to pick up the analysis a little closer to the ground. Because what's true in this grand scheme of things is also visible to us from our own graduate classrooms and within our own scholarship. One of the guides to the local terrain that I'm working with today is Lisa Ruddick, a professor of English at the University of Chicago. In 2015, in preparation for a review that she was conducting of the state of affairs in her own field of literary criticism, Ruddick interviewed about 70 graduate students who were enrolled in English programs. And she, as she analyzed their responses, there were two sets of students that stood out for her because of their sense of uneasiness in their studies. She identified the first group, not unexpectedly, as, quote, those who bridle at the left political conformity of English. Those folks didn't feel at home. But it was the second group of students that really intrigued her more because she didn't know exactly how to name their unease. She describes them as talented students, quote, reflective, intuitive individuals with English teacher written all over them. But despite that desirable and seemingly ideal profile, she notes that something in the intellectual environment, as she put it, is eating them alive, leaving them with, quote, unaccountable feelings of confusion, inhibition, and loss. And for her, this state was, uh, this condition was a matter of concern. Ruddick attributes uh, the cause of the alienation to a kind of deadness or meanness that infects some of the humanities. And I'm going to quote her at some length so you can get a feel for her analysis. She says, I believe that the progressive fervor of the humanities, while it re-energized inquiry in the 1980s, has since and has since inspired countless valid lines of inquiry masks a second order complex that is all about the thrill of destruction. In the name of critique, everything except critique can be invaded or denatured. This is the game of academic cool that flourished in the era of high theory. Yet what began as theory now persists as style, Though it's hardly the case that everyone, progressive or otherwise, approves of this mode, it enjoys prestige, a fact that cannot but affect morale in the field as a whole. Decades of anti-humanist one-upmanship have left the profession with a fascination for shaking the value out of what seems human, alive, and whole. Ruddick identifies the skewing of humanities scholarship towards what's wrong in the world and away from what she identifies as, and here I quote her again, experiences and ideals that non-academics treat as a matter of tender concern. The subset of students that she identified are the canaries in the coal mine of the humanities. They're unable to thrive 
when much that drew them to the subject matter in the first place is now considered out of bounds for or beneath the concern of serious scholarship. Reddick isn't alone in this diagnosis. Eve Sedgwick named something similar in her widely respected earlier analysis of the practices of what she contrasts as paranoid and reparative readings. With the term paranoid, Sedgwick circumscribes the interpretive practices that we would call hermeneutics of suspicion with their attention to the effects of ideology, the exercise of power, and the constraints on human agency. That scholarship in the humanities is really dominated now by this mode. But for Sedgwick, the term paranoid names more than the hermeneutics of suspicion. It also names the kind of affective power that's at work in scholars. Um, an element that's necessary to account for the dominance of this approach, what makes it sticky and appealing to us. Paranoia, she says, is vigilant and protective. It scans the environment for bad surprises that might humiliate or show us to be fallible in our work. Hermeneutics of suspicion promises to spare us the negative experience of being shown that we're wrong or worse, that we're naive in our arguments. It's not that Sedgwick or Reddick think we should do away with suspicious readings of our sources uh, or scholarship about our sources. Quite the contrary, they both think it serves a place. But rather, they both express concern about the triumph or dominance of these approaches. Uh, as Sedgwick puts it, the dominance of paranoid readings unintentionally impoverishes the gene pool of scholarly perspectives. And in doing so, it diminishes our ability to respond to environmental changes like those we're in the middle of now, where there's a kind of a truth crisis in the world. In our own field, about 20 years ago now, Bruce Lincoln published a pithy set of 13 theses on methods for those working in the history of religions. That piece has had a remarkable staying power and its brevity, I think it's three pages long, belies its influence. The theses that he composed speak to practices that distinguish the academic study of historical religious phenomena from more ordinary interests in religion and especially from the practice of religion and, the, and religiosity in itself. Much of what Lincoln said in that piece is now standard practice in the study of religion. Uh, take for instance, here's his last thesis, thesis 13. When one permits those whom one studies to define the terms in which they will be understood, suspends one's interest in the temporal and contingent, or fails to distinguish between truths, truth claims, and regimes of truth, one has ceased to function as a historian or scholar. In that moment, a variety of roles are available, some perfectly respectable, amanuensis, collector, friend, and advocate, and some less appealing, cheerleader, voyeur, retailer of import goods. None, however, should be confused with scholarship. There is obvious wisdom in Lincoln's injunction, and it lies in fostering more fully consciously informed judgments about the questions we ask and the means by which we pursue them. It also, I would note, uh, speaks pretty clearly of Musto's principle of separation. Here, what the scholar does with their subject is completely distinct from the relationship that ordinary people, collectors and cheerleaders, do with the subject. This thesis at the same time is an apt illustration of Sedgwick's concern about the unintentionally stultifying effect of suspicious readings on our subject. Whether intentionally or not, Lincoln's formulation has had the effect of invalidating inquiries that might overlap with the interests of our subjects. 
Here, I don't mean confessional or apologetic overlap, but the interest in the same fundamentally human concerns that animated ancient authors. Can the terms that our subjects provide only ever be false or inadequate? So uh, on to cognitive science, sorry, here we go. Um, my starting point for consideration of meaning and defining what meaning is lies outside of the humanities, uh, within the social sciences, and within a wide range of empirical studies that map the human orientation to making sense of things. If something distinguishes us as a species, it's this drive to always make sense. I'm gonna jump straight into a couple of experiments and I hope you'll bear with me. I promise I'll bring them back to conversation with the humanities. But the first of these um, is a set of studies that pertain to a phenomenon called the Stroop effect. And now uh, folks, this is the audience participation portion of the presentation. So passive participation, but still participation. So buckle up. Um, you see here on the screen, the word yellow, um, unhelpfully displayed in green text. When I start the video in a minute, what you're going to see is a, a stream of color words. And in each case, the word is displayed in a color that's different from the meaning of the word. So your task, and if you're alone at home, do it out loud, play along at home. Uh, your task is to name the color of the text, not to repeat the word that's printed on the screen. So in this case, you'd want to say green, not yellow. Okay. Are you ready to play? <laughs> it lasts for about a minute, so try to do it all the way through. Um, here we go. Or not. This will be very disappointing. Oh, no. I transferred the slides from my other computer to this one. Well, shoot. Does anybody have any uh, wisdom on how to get this to play? I'm guessing the link is dead. Dag nabbit. All right, here you can get a sense of it anyway, um, although not nearly as exciting. Um, this list of words is really easy to do that task with. Green, blue, yellow, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green. And it's easy to do it because the meaning of the word in no way participates in the same realm as the color. This one is easy to do because there's coherence between the word itself and the chromatic information about the word, red, yellow, green, blue, red, blue, yellow, green, blue, red. This one is the Stroop effect. Now you can try to do this yourself as quickly as possible. You want to name, the color that it's printed in, not the word. I see lips moving. <laughs> it's surprisingly challenging, isn't it? Um, if the video had worked, and I promise I'll get over that pretty soon, uh, by the end of the 50 seconds that it runs, you feel a surprising sense of uh, tension in your body. It gets increasingly exhausting to try to concentrate on saying the right word. And uh, if you notice that tension in your body, you are consciously confirming what's been measured experimentally in a variety of ways. And to summarize it briefly, such violation of meaning expectations, in this case, the meaning, the semantic meaning and the chromatic meaning contradict each other, violate one another. 
Um, and all of those violations of meaning expectations actually trigger a biologically aversive response in human beings. We feel measurable physical discomfort when an anticipated outcome is thwarted or placed in an irresolvable tension. And that discomfort prompts us to compensate, to seek palliative effects in a variety of different ways. So clearly the definition of meaning that's at play in an exercise like this is different from the larger meaning quests that are generally associated with the humanities. Meaning in this framework is not primarily calibrated to big existential questions about the meaning of life. Indeed, uh, the psychologists Travis Prue and Michael Inslick have defined meaning in the way it works in these studies very simply as a sense of what is going on and a sense of why it should be so. And meaning can be violated at either of these places at the level of perceivable facts or at the level of explanations for those facts. The what in their construction depends on continuous epistemological engagement with the stuff of the world and the knowledge we accumulate both with and without conscious attention and discernment. And in fact, non-conscious accumulation of data uh, of generally reliable facts about the world comprises far more of the what than does uh, our conscious reflection on the reality of the world. For Proulx and Inslick, the why of meaning serves the sense that this stuff of our lives is sufficiently predictable and controllable. This is what we're striving for. Can we know the world to a degree that we can anticipate what's coming next, that we can be prepared to deal with it? And human cognition is highly tuned to the to cause and effect predictions, often positing causation even where none exists, seeing faces in clouds, where if you look at a plug in your room right now, you can easily see a face in the uh, little electrical socket too. Uh, this is how our minds work over interpreting. As Pruel and Inslick waded through um, scores of psychological studies, and each of these studies was um, designed for, their, for its own reasons, um, not for the purposes that they use. But as they looked through this swath of psychological studies, they noticed they identified a consistent pattern of human behavior that's present in all of them. Uh, first of all, that in cases of meaning violation, it begins with a, the detection of a violation, either the facts are disrupted or the links about why they're happening become unreliable. Secondly, there is a, a biologically aversive reaction to the loss of meaning. Um, it's also uh, been pretty closely, um, it con uh, it's consistent with the activation of particular neurological response as well. So brain studies have shown that across these wide variety of violations, it's the same response. A biological state of arousal, physical discomfort, and a neurological response. And thirdly, that this disruption, this bad feeling in our bodies, in fact, is adaptive because it prompts us to look for palliative compensation. It's a way of saying, you need better calibration of meaning. Start looking for it. Uh, returning to Musto's paradigm, uh, human beings are evolutionarily shaped to seek and protect relevance. All of this is about looking for relevance in the immediate world around us. So in circumstances uh, like the um, Stroop exercise, the meaning implications go away pretty quickly. They end with the test itself and the discomfort dissipates quickly. However, psychologists have also studied more lasting uh, realistic violations of meaning expectations, and these violations persist longer 
and prompt more extreme responses. Uh, you can imagine how conspiracy theories are a version of this, trying to reestablish meaning by grabbing on to uh, the first available explanation. You can also imagine uh, how the hermeneutics of suspicion might function in this model, trying to avoid ever having meaning violated by not leaning on the side of believing in much. But here's just one more experiment of a more real world kind of situation. Um, and uh, it comes from the psychologist Mel Lerner, who devoted his life to exploring a particular meaning bias that seems to be ubiquitous in human beings. He calls it the just world bias. And it's the reflex that's in all of us that if something bad happens to someone, there has to be a reason for it. So if you've ever thought, even privately, why me? That comes straight from the heart of the just world bias. Uh, why not you would be uh, one response. But uh, with, if there isn't a reason for what happens to me in an extreme way, life would become absurd. I wouldn't be able to prepare myself for what comes next. So one of the experiments, and there were many uh, that he designed, uh, used a video recording of a staged learning task. So in this case, it was an actor pretending to be a real participant. So the actor, a confederate in the experiment, is supposedly memorizing sets of randomly paired words. Uh, so uh, whenever, and then after they memorize them, they're shown one of the words and they have to remember the second one. And whenever they don't remember it correctly, they're given an electrical shock. Now, in this case, the actor isn't really shocked. They just pretend to be, and uh, they show uh, moderate pain or puzzlement when it happens. The real subjects in the experiment are um, students who come in and are told that they're supposed to watch this learning task, and they're supposed to track the signs of emotional arousal in the purported learner. So, and when that part of the study is over, the students who are the real subjects are given a questionnaire about the personality of the person they watched. They're asked things like how intelligent or unintelligent, likable or unlikable, nervous, calm, patient, impatient. They have to rate the subject or the, the actor on all of these characteristics. So there were a number of experimental conditions. I hope you're not hating this. <laughs> Walk through an experiment um, when you came for a biblical studies address. In the control condition, one group of students is told, all right, you're about to watch an actor. So they know that it's an actor, but they nonetheless go ahead and rate the person afterward on all of the same characteristics. That's the control group. In the experimental conditions, there are two possibilities. In one case, the actor uh, just goes along with the experiment and it runs all the way through. I should say in all of these cases, all of the students watch exactly the same videotape. Some of them think it's live. Only the people in the control condition know that it's taped and an actor. So, uh, one set of students just watches it all the way through. Another set of students is given a case where halfway through uh, the supposedly closed circuit TV is stopped and the um, person running the experiment says, we're now talking to the subject and asking them if they want to continue or not. We're telling them, you know, because this hurts, uh, we're giving them the option to pull out or we're telling them, they can continue because you are learning a lot from this and their participation really benefits you. So the Confederate continues out of altruism or the Confederate quits. You're probably anticipating that the results then on the evaluations don't come out the same. The two that are marked in red are the places where the students evaluate exactly the same person in exactly the same videotape as not as smart, not as attractive, not as pleasant, 
not as quick. It's exactly the same tape, but where they're suffering with no chance of intervention, or where they decide to continue to suffer, students who are evaluating them compensate for this bad thing happening to a good person by blaming the victim. <clears throat> this is just one example of a whole series of studies that demonstrate our willingness to blame the victim in order to protect our sense that consequences are predictable and that socially valued behavior should result in a predictable social uh, reward. It's an innate bias that makes it possible to trust the world as generally predictable and safe. One of the laziest ways we can imagine the why of meaning is to blame the victim for the misfortune. There are truer but more cognitively taxing ways to maintain meaning. For instance, by looking at systematic factors to understand the whys, or to engage the fact that there is a certain amount of lack of control of the world, make that part of our meaning structures. Most meaning making that we do is the down and dirty, convenient, half considered kind. And religious systems participate in each of these sorts of meaning maintenance, from the lazier opportunistic types to the more insightful revisions of either the what or the why. And finally, now I'm going to turn to religion. My own uh, research interest in this question is sort of nestled down in the muck of Christian origins and the enduring question of the rapid rise of Christianity. And I'll jumpstart the conversation uh, by um, reference to Rodney Stark's watershed book, uh, The Rise of Christianity. Stark has um, integrated several hypotheses into this book. And before I unintentionally trigger your hermeneutics of suspicion about rational choice theory, which is one of his hypotheses, let me clarify that I'm only interested today in one of his proposals, and that is the effect of plagues, the plagues that ravaged the population of the Roman Empire in the first few centuries CE, and how those plagues contributed both to the decline of Roman culture and to the rise of Christian culture. Um, <clears throat> so there were uh, two really significant uh, plagues, one in 165 CE, a smallpox epidemic that lasted for 15 years. And it's estimated that a quarter to a third of the population of the empire died. Um, some people estimate 5,000 people per day dying in Rome. And the second one in 251 was an epidemic that's now thought to have been something like Ebola um, because it uh, seems to have implicated neurological systems and breakdown internal tissues. There was internal bleeding um, and so on. It's sometimes called Cyprian's plague because the writings of Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage, provide the fullest account of just how gruesome the effects of this pandemic were. So about the pandemics, Stark argues that whatever we might say about the beginnings of Christianity as a movement, we can look toward a, a later point and identify the period at which the social cultural phenomenon of Christianity succeeded where the social cultural phenomenon of the empire failed. And here is part of what he says about it. The epidemics, these two epidemics, swamped the explanatory and comforting capacities of paganism and of Hellenic philosophies. And uh, religion um, in particular, first, the religion may fail to provide a satisfactory explanation of why the disaster occurred. And second, the religion may seem to be unavailing against the disaster. He offers a hypothesis that fits 
pretty well with Prue and Inslick's studies of the fundamental need for human, uh, the human need for a predictable, controllable worldview captured in these two quotes. In fact, uh, the Christ movement appears to have done both these things, both to have offered a satisfactory explanation of why and to have actually availed against the circumstances of the pandemics. Afterlife concepts and the related rituals and metaphors and myths that went along with them provided the ingredients for explanation. And at the same time, those who were affiliates of Christ groups seem to have survived the pandemics at higher rates than the general population because they were equipped to act altruistically toward one another in caring for one another in contrast to the general population that tended to flee urban areas and abandon the sick as a lost cause. Uh, <clears throat> so there are a few ways now that I want to trace that um, afterlife ideas, um, in fact, solved meaning problems in this moment within history. Uh, and I, I wanna say too, of course, Christianity wasn't the first place where afterlife ideas existed. Part of the advantage of this is that they're already culturally available um, and they're, they're sort of thoroughly established within Judaism, but not exercised or, or not applied with the kind of all-inclusive continuing sense that they came to be applied with in Christianity. So the first thing that these beliefs did is to remove the tension around risky altruistic behaviors because human beings do have impulses to act altruistically toward one another. It's just that they aren't the only impulses that we have. Of course, we also have the impulse towards self-protection. Um, but Christians uh, tended to care for the sick, to share goods during the pandemic, and part of the reason they did so was because life was now extended beyond death. Something more was going to happen. And so even if rewards weren't immediately available for altruistic behaviors, they would eventually be there. So the tension between self-serving and other serving is resolved in this belief. Secondly, it diffused, uh, afterlife beliefs diffused the dilemma of bad things happening to good people straight back to Mel Lerner's experiments about a just world theory. Because ultimately, again, reward and consolation is still to come. Uh, bad things are only temporary and the appearance of indiscriminate suffering is um, temporary as well. Uh, the notion is it'll be resolved later. And the third thing that it did was to generate boundaries of shared risk benefit among uh, adherents of the movement. We can see all of this in Cyprian's own writing. And here's an example. Um, he says, uh, you may be worried that there doesn't seem to be any discrimination in the human race, that the just are dying with the un unjust. But then he says, that's wrong. It's not a common destruction for both evil and good. The just are called to refreshment. The unjust are carried off to torture. He really uh, accelerates this a little bit. He even goes so far as to say how suitable and necessary that the plague that seems so horrible is in fact sorting out these details for us. And then here too, uh, we see that he specifies exactly what the altruistic behavior should look like, that the plague, the pandemic is examining the minds of the human race to see whether they care for the sick, whether relatives love their kinsmen, whether masters show compassion to their slaves, whether physicians do not desert the afflicted. It's interesting to note that in his outline of altruism, the person with the advantage is using it for the sake of the one who doesn't have it. And these behaviors turned out to be effective. They do seem to have saved lives. 
they were in that sense, what we might call good. Now, at the same time, there is a lot to critique in Cyprian's interventions. He's pretty content that a big group of people should die and die painfully and then be tortured. He uses threats of hell to constrain other people's behaviors. In some passages, other passages, his injunctions are pretty strongly gendered in some pretty ugly ways as well. And um, he suggests that sexuality is part of what everyone is saved from by an earthly death. You'd hardly call Cyprian sex positive. So I don't mean to suggest that we should avoid applying the hermeneutics of suspicion to Cyprian's writings. We should not. Rather, what I'd like to suggest is that by considering the effectiveness of this particular moment from the perspective of meaning making, we can actually identify a whole set of other questions that might be asked. Questions that are part of a reparative reading, to use Sedgwick's term. What are the conditions in which compassion is motivated? How can those conditions be made more intelligently meaningful? How can they be more fully integrated into a truer sense of the world? How do we mobilize behavior that coincides with our intellectual commitment to the common good? We're committed, how do we make behavior correspond to it? Cyprian and others were effective at a point of enormous humanitarian need he managed to mobilize an effective construct for the why of meaning. Cyprian was also flawed and partial in elements of his position, even outright wrong about much of the what of meaning. But if we do not allow the tenderness of care for the well being of others to infuse our scholarship about this period in history, we're learning only a fraction of what this moment has to teach us, the lessons of history that we could end up repeating again. So my thoughts today have been informed primarily by two interlocutors. From Musto, I've reflected on this distinctive balance in academia between separation from everyday uh, constructions of meaning separation for the sake of deeper insights and analysis, that's on the one hand, and the vitality of non-trivial relevance that that separation should help buy for us. Its purpose is uh, to move toward relevance. And with Lisa Ruddick's analysis, uh, she brings more nuance to Musto's paradigm by showing how academic relevance has partially atrophied in our contemporary work. It's atrophied into the realm of negation of false claims, something that's important for us to do, but not the only thing. We're relevant right now, primarily because we show what's wrong. We interrupt false meaning constructions, which is such an important contribution of what we do. But too often, without also making contributions to constructive, reparative readings. In the collective work of making life more navigable, academia has conducted something of a slash and burn exercise without planting a fruit bearing crop in its place. Hermeneutics of suspicion effectively expose power dynamics and the abuse of, po abuse of power but they can't account positively for other forms of human agency, particularly for the longing for better social configurations, for generosity, even for beauty, matters of tender concern to people both in the past and the present. So the very modest form of meaning making that I'm arguing for doesn't lie in the sphere of ultimate truth claims, but in the more modest daily need to be able to navigate through uncertainty while maintaining humanist values, to create a sense of meaning that's sufficient to make effective action viable, to address questions of meaning as essentially human. 
And surely this work is allocated to those of us in the humanities in particular, among other useful things we do. So the proposal is that we might also analyze our material for interconnectedness and dependency of its elements for the construction of an interpretable world. And maybe at least once in a while to even be caught in the act of caring, which is rarely cool and often vulnerable, but what better way to use our privilege. Thanks for your attention. I want to thank Colleen Schantz for that very thoughtful and interesting, engaging. Uh,